Well, please open in your Bible, if you will, to Matthew chapter 11. As I was praying about what the Lord would have us study together tonight, He put on my heart to have us look at a very special and precious portion of Scripture in Matthew 11. The title of the message tonight is Rest for Your Soul. Rest for Your Soul. And the Scripture we want to look at is in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. In the last century, there was a great pastor, a great man of God. His name was Peter Marshall. He pastored in New York City, and God had such an anointing on his life that eventually he became the chaplain of the Senate here in the United States of America. And he was a powerful preacher. He was an anointed preacher. But there was a story that he would often tell, and Peter Marshall was kind of known for telling this amazing story, the story called The Keeper of the Spring. It goes like this. Many years ago, there was a quiet old man who lived high above a beautiful Austrian village on the eastern slopes of the Alps. And this wonderful old man had been hired by the town council below to clear away all of the debris from the spring that fed the small lake in the center of their quaint little town. With faithful, silent regularity, this keeper of the spring would patrol the hills above and remove any of the leaves and the branches and the sticks that would muck up the spring and the pools of water above so that there would always be a flow of fresh water to the village that was down below. Well, as you might imagine, in time, this little town became a very popular attraction among tourists. Graceful swans floated in the lake. The mill wheels of business turned round and round, splashing with clear water. The farmlands were naturally irrigated, and the view from the restaurants was picturesque beyond describing. But many were unaware that the reason why their little town was what it was had to do with the keeper of the spring. They thought that the reason everyone wanted to come to their village had to do with what they were doing. And so one day when the keeper of the spring happened to visit the village, the town council called him into their chambers and informed him that they didn't need him anymore, that they could take care of things on their own. They could spend their money on better things than an old keeper of the spring. Well, at first, nothing changed. But as the trees shed their leaves and as the small branches snapped off, they began to muck up the spring and the pools of water that were above. And down in the village below, people started to notice a yellowish-brown tint in the stream and the lake. The few days later, the water had become much darker, and within a week, a slimy film covered the lake, and the now dirty water had an awful smell. The swans left. The mill wheels ground to a halt. The crops began to die. The villagers started getting sick, and the tourists all went away. Realizing they had made a terrible mistake, the town council went out in search of the old keeper of the spring. And with great humility, they sought his forgiveness, and they pleaded for his help. And at their simple invitation, the keeper of the spring went back to work. He cleared out the sticks and the leaves and all of the junk that had plugged up the, and polluted the water. And in no time at all, the water below was clear and clean and fresh again. The sick villagers got well. 
the mill wheels turned again, the crops began to grow, and the swans and the tourists came back again. You see, the life of the village depended on the health of the spring. And Peter Marshall used to say, you are the town. And the spring is your soul. Everything you are and everything you do comes out of your inner person, your soul. The Bible says in Proverbs 4 and verse 23, keep your heart, keep your soul, keep your inner person with all diligence because out of it, comes all the issues of life. The most important part of you isn't your body. It is your soul. And the keeping of your soul is the most significant thing you can do. This is why I like a book by John Ortberg called Soul keeping, caring for the most important part of you. I like that title. Soul keeping, caring for the most important part of you. John Ortberg was a well-known pastor here in the United States of a very large church. And he was so busy, 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 hurried, hurried, hurried with the hectic pace of life and ministry, he knew something was wrong. And so one day he called up a friend and a mentor, Dallas Willard, who um, is a great spiritual formation writer and professor. And he began to describe to Dallas Willard all that was going on in his life. And he said, can you just help me? I, I, I need some help. What, what is it that I need to do so that things will change in my life? There was silence on the other end of the line, and all of a sudden, Dallas Willard said, well, here's what you need to do. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. There was a pause. Orberg says, well, that's, that's really good. I wrote that one down. What else do I need to do? There was another pause. Willard said, there is nothing else. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. In his book, Soul Keeping, Orberg writes, I've concluded that my life and the well-being of those around me depend on Willard's prescription. Hurry is the great enemy of, our spiritual, of spiritual life in our day. Hurry destroys our souls. As someone has well said, hurry is not of the devil. It is the devil. Hurry, 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 hurry. Busy, 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 busy. Reminds me of what happened many years ago. There were some explorers who went over to Africa. They wanted to see the countryside, and so they hired some uh, local African tribal guides, and they wanted to get to a certain location, so they kept pushing the guides. We, let's go a little further. Let's go a little faster. We need to get there. And they kept driving them and driving them. And finally, they reached one point, and these African guys, they just sat down. And they said, we're not going to move. They said, well, we got to get up and go. And they said, we're not going to move. And they said, why are you not going to move? And they said, we must pause and wait for our souls to catch up with our bodies. The founder of that little devotional, Our Daily Bread, Henry Bosch, comments on that story. And he says, if our schedule leaves no time for rest and nurturing our spiritual life, we are just too busy. God does not ask us 
to be constantly on the go, rushing here and there. Sometimes God wants us to rest a while so that our souls can catch up. And this is exactly what Jesus was talking about in the passage of Scripture that we're studying tonight. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30, Jesus talks about having rest for your soul. Notice what he says. In Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 28, Jesus says, Come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and Learn from me, for I am meek or gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Again, Jesus says, Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and you learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Dear ones, those precious words are found only in the Gospel of Matthew, only here. You will not find these words in Mark. You will not find these words in Luke. You will not find these words in John. You will find them here and only here. And so precious, so wonderful, so powerful, so important are these words that that great preacher in London, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, preached no less than 12 messages on this passage alone. The key part of what Jesus says is right at the end of verse 29. Look there again, underline it. You will find rest for your souls. Your soul, what's that? Well, in the Bible, it's your mind, it's your emotions, it's your heart, it's your spirit, it's your inner person. It's that most important part of you. And Jesus said that most important part of you needs rest. The Greek word translated rest, anapausis, means refreshing. It means restoring. It means renewing your soul, your heart, your inner person. It needs resting. It needs restoring. It needs renewing. You rest your body, but what about rest for your soul? I'm convinced, I'm absolutely convinced. So many Christians in America, that is exactly what's lacking. It's exactly what they need. And as I was praying, I just believe there are so many of you here tonight. That's exactly what you need. You've come here and you need rest for your soul. But here's the question. How do you find rest for your soul? Well, I'm so glad you asked, because right here Jesus tells us exactly how you can get rest for your soul. The key to any passage of the Bible so many times is to look for what are the action words. When we teach students in the Bible college uh, here and over in Golden Springs, Calvary Chapel Bible College, when we teach them we teach them, look for these words, because they will show you what a passage is all about. And in this passage, there are three key action words, three key verbs. I want you to underline them right now in your Bible. So when you go back, you'll know what this passage is all about. It's all about rest for your soul, but how do you get that rest? I want you to underline in verse 28 the word come. Then I want you to underline in verse 29 the word take. And then I want you to underline in verse 29 the word learn. Come, take, learn. Come, take, learn. Can you say those three words with me? Come, take, learn. Say them again. 
Come, take, if you want to have rest for your soul, number one, you've got to come to Jesus. Number two, you've got to yoke with Jesus. And number three, you've got to learn from Jesus. If you will come to Jesus and yoke with Jesus and learn from Jesus, then what will happen is you'll have that renewing, that refreshing, that rest for your inner person, your heart, your mind, your emotions, your soul. The first thing that we need to do if we want to have rest for our souls is we need to come to Jesus. Notice in verse 28, Jesus says again, Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is such a wonderful and beautiful invitation. Notice the first word. Jesus says, come. In the original, that word come is in a present tense, which means it is continuous and repeated. In other words, it means to come to him over and over and over and over again. True people come to Jesus and pray a sinner's prayer and experience what we call salvation, but that's not the end of it for the believer because Jesus invites us to come and to keep on coming, to come to him in the morning, to come to him at noon, to come to him at night, to come to him on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and Sunday, to come to him in January and February and March and April, May and June, July and August and September and October and November and December, to come to him and to keep coming to him over and over again. Jesus is inviting you even tonight, come, come to me. Come to me all. I like that word all. <laughs> not come to me some of you or many of you or most of you. Not, not come to me those of you who are rich and famous or those of you who are well known or those of you who are mighty or those of, uh, of you who, who need nothing. He says come to me all. Our Savior is a whosoever will may come Savior. Come to him if you're a man. Come to him if you're a woman. Come to him if you're young. Come to him if you're old. Come to him if you're rich or poor or educated or uneducated. The arms of Jesus are open. Come and keep on coming to him. All of us can come to him no matter who we are. No matter where we are. No matter what's going on in our life. The invitation is always an open invitation. But though all of us are always welcome to come to him, this invitation of Jesus is so precious because he doesn't just throw it out to anybody and everybody. He says, come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come unto me all who are weary. It's the word kapiao in Greek, and a very interesting word. It's a word that means to, be, to labor, to work, to be exhausted, to be worn out. He's talking about the physical side of it. Not going to ask you to raise your hand, but so many in this room tonight have worked all day long, and you're weary and exhausted and worn out and it's possible for people to wake up early and work all day and go to bed late and do the same thing the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day and, the next day. and not only are they physically weary but something happens inside of them this word translated weary can not only mean to work to labor to be exhausted to be worn out it can also be translated to be discouraged, to lose heart, to come to the place that you want to give up. I was talking about the inward side of this because there's an outward side of it. The stress, the pressure, the anxiety, the constant go, 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 work, 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 work. What can happen? 
is it can make you weary, not only physically weary, but mentally weary and emotionally weary. And Jesus says, when you're tired and when you're worn out and when you're discouraged and when you're worried and frustrated, come to me, all who are weary. And what causes the weariness? Well, the next phrase, and heavy laden. The word translated heavy laden fortizo in Greek means to be burdened, to be weighed down. Over time, things begin to pile up on you and pile up on you and pile up on you and pile up on you until you are weary, weary, discouraged, and tired and Jesus says come to me come to me come to me and do you know what there are so many people in our world who are weary and heavy laden <laughs> you work with them you live next door to them you live with them. Some of them are your family and your friends. There are so many who are weary and heavy laden. And what they need is to come to Jesus. Weary? It reminds me, it reminds me of the true story of a man named Joseph Crater. It, to this day, is still one of the most mysterious and mystifying cases of missing persons in the FBI. On August 15, 1930, a 45-year-old New York State Supreme Court Justice named Joseph Crater spent an evening out eating uh, Italian dinner with his friends. He walked out of the restaurant, he hailed a taxi, and he was never seen from or heard from again. The FBI, because he was a Supreme Court Justice in New York, was immediately called in to investigate the case. They initially thought it was kidnapping because uh, someone had a judicial grudge, but that lead never panned out. Then next they thought it was mafia activity because he was an enemy of the mafia, but that, that led nowhere as well. To this day, there's only one clue that remained. When Mrs. Crater returned to their apartment the evening that her husband disappeared, on the table was a large check and there was a note attached to the check in her husband's handwriting, which simply said this, I am very, very tired, love Joe. And he was never seen from or heard from again. Too bad he didn't know about Jesus. Too bad he didn't come to Jesus. Too bad he didn't know the invitation was open all who are weary and burdened down, come to me and I will give you rest. But you know what? Here's the truth. Even many of God's people, even many Christians feel weary and heavy laden. We thank God for technology, but the frantic pace of our lives and the constant barrage of texts and emails and all of these things begins to take its toll. Tim Hansel, in a great book I like called When I Relax, I Feel Guilty, <laughs> he writes, Ours is the day of a half-read page before the road rage, the day of a quick hash to make a mad dash, the day of bright lights and our nerves are tight. The day of a plane hop for just a brief stop. The day of a lamp tan in a short span. The day of the brain strained until our heart is pained. The day of a short nap until the spring snaps. We hurry and we worry and for what? Do you hear your Savior? Do you hear his still small voice speaking to you right now?
come to me. Come to me. Come to me. But here's the thing. To come to Jesus, you must come away from the world. I want to say that again. Might be the most important thing that I say tonight. To come to Jesus, you must come away from the world. You must come away from your cell phone. You must come away from your computer. You must come away from your television. You must come away from the hurry and the flurry and the busyness around you. You must come apart and spend time with Jesus. In Mark 6 and verse 31, Jesus said to his disciples, Come apart with me and rest for a while. And Mark adds why Jesus said that. Jesus said, Come apart with me and rest for a while. For they were coming and going and didn't even have time to eat. Of course, you would never skip lunch because you're so busy. You would never rush off without breakfast because you're so busy. And Jesus said, come apart with me and rest for a while. I like how Warren Wiersbe said it. He said, if you don't come apart with Jesus, you will come apart. Come apart. Do you hear him? Come to me. Leave your phone at home. Go for a walk. Go for a drive in your car and don't turn on the radio. Come apart. Come to him. He's inviting you. He's inviting you tonight to come to him. There was a Danish sculptor named Bertel Thorvaldsen. And Thorvaldsen is known for his most famous statue that he chiseled, a statue called the Christ. Today, if you go to a Lutheran church in Copenhagen, you can see this masterpiece of art. But there is an interesting story behind Thorvaldsen chiseling that famous statue, the Christ. Before chiseling the marble, Thorvaldsen made a model of clay so he would know exactly how he wanted it to look like so when he chiseled it in the marble that it would come out right. And he had in his mind something that he wanted to make. He had this powerful image of Jesus where Jesus' head was lifted in majesty, his hands were raised in power and authority, and he worked on the clay, he worked on the clay, he worked on the clay till it was just perfect. He went home that night and the window of the studio was open. His studio happened to be right near the ocean. And the cold ocean air and the night fog came into the room so that in the morning when Thorvaldsen came in, the head of Christ was not lifted up. It was drooped down. <laughs> the hands of Christ were not lifted up. They were drooped down. And he looked at his work all that time and effort and he thought, man, this is... He began to get all frustrated and then God whisper to his heart, that's how it's supposed to look. So he began to chisel that career in marble. So what would be a savior who's looking down with his hands open to anyone? And down below when he was all done, he chiseled the words that begin this text in verse 28, come unto me. Come unto me. Do you hear your savior? whispering to your heart tonight, dear one, you need rest in your soul. You need to come to me. But if you want that rest, you not only need to come to Jesus, you need to yoke with Jesus. This is what we see in verse 29 and 30. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm meek and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Yoke? Take my yoke upon you? What is Jesus talking about? Well, so many people in our day, because they don't live on a farm, 
They don't work with that. Well, what in the world's a yoke? Well, a, a yoke was a piece of wood. It had usually two holes in it because two oxen would plow together and the farmer would yoke up the two oxen and then he would go behind them with a plow and he would plow his field. A yoke. And it speaks of a work that is to be done. The rest that Jesus will give to you isn't a rest of doing nothing. It's a rest of doing what he calls you to do. Because you see, Jesus has a work for you to do that only you can do. Two things about this beautiful yoke. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy, he said. That is an interesting word in the original. It is the word krestos. Here's what it means. Comfortable. Well-fitting. Designed just for you. You know what this word means because you've gone to the shoe store to buy shoes before. <laughs> and you try this one on now <laughs> and that one, no. And then you find that pair of shoes that fits just right. And the longer you have it, the more comfortable those, you don't care what they look like or what anybody says about it, man. Those are my comfortable shoes. And Jesus, listen, has a yoke that is fit just for you. Listen, it's custom made. The size of it is perfect for you and only you. It is fascinating that this yoke was made of wood and that Jesus was the son of Joseph, the carpenter. New Testament scholar Myron Ellsberg describes how there is an ancient tradition that in Joseph's carpenter shop, one of their specialties was to make yokes for oxen. And that there was a sign on the wall where Jesus worked with his father that said, best fitting yokes made here. And Jesus has a work for you to do. And only for you to do Sometimes the reason why people are weary and heavy laden is because they're doing what they're not supposed to do. They're doing what somebody else is supposed to do, but not what they're supposed to do. They're not doing what God has called them to do. They want to do something that everybody else is called to do. And you will find rest for your soul only when you know what is it that the Lord has called you to do. Jesus says, my yoke will fit you perfectly. You'll lie, oh, this is so comfortable. But his yoke is not only well-fitting, easy, comfortable, his Burden is light. Why would he say that? Because in ancient times when the farmers yoked up those two oxen, they did something interesting. They would yoke an older, stronger, wiser oxen with a younger, weaker oxen to let the younger one begin to understand what working in the field was all about. And so when they did that, all of the weight was being carried by that older, wiser, stronger oxen so that the younger one really wasn't carrying anything at all. It was fun. It was easy. And Jesus says, come to me. Come right in beside me. Come to that place where I've designed for you. Nobody else. It's for you. And let me do all the pulling. See, when you try to do any work on your own, you're going to fail. You're going to wear out. You're going to get weary. But when you get in beside Jesus and Jesus is doing all the work, you're like, this is awesome. This is seriously amazing. Yoke with me. What does that mean? It's it's a metaphor, it's an illustration, uh, it's an image of walking with Jesus. 
come to Jesus, get close to Jesus, and walk with Him, walk with Him, walk with Him, walk with Him, learn His mind, learn His heart, be with Him, spend a time with Him. That's where rest for your soul is. It isn't in the latest movie. It isn't in the latest entertainment. It isn't a day at the beach. It isn't a day at Disneyland. What you really need is rest in your soul. And you're only going to find that rest in your soul when you come in close to Jesus and walk with Jesus. The old saints knew that. I remember when I was in Bible college, one of the ministries that I did that I loved so much was to go into the rest homes, the nursing homes. And I used to go in on Sunday afternoons and do a little service for all of the old folks that, that were there. We had these little hymn books, you know, with um, the, the, the size print on it was like 99 or something like that. I mean, it was monstrously big. And I would always say this, you know, here they are in their little wheelchairs or whatever. And I, I would always say, that, what, what, what song do you want to sing today? And every single time, they would say, can we sing that old song, Just a Closer Walk with Thee? The words, I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. Through this world of toil and snares, if I falter, Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? None but thee. <laughs> None but thee. For the chorus, just a closer walk with thee, grant it, Jesus, is my plea, daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord. Let it be. Try it tomorrow on your lunch hour. Just walk out of the office. Go for a five-minute walk with Jesus. Watch what happens to your day. Get up a few minutes earlier tomorrow and go for a walk with Jesus. Tomorrow night when you get home, instead of turning on the television, which tells you to buy all these things you don't need, <laughs> and in this, you will, all these you know, depressing news stories, get your, your mind all worried and anxious and freaked, just go for a walk. Just walk with Jesus. How do you find rest for your soul? Number one, you come to Jesus. Number two, you yoke with Jesus. You walk with Jesus. And number three, you learn from Jesus. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn. And learn from me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Learn from me. The word Montano here is such a beautiful word. It means to be discipled by. It means to be personally tutored by. <laughs> you know, there are things that Jesus wants to teach you? Have you ever thought about how wonderful that is? Let's suppose you wanted to play the piano and Beethoven were still alive. And he said, meet me at the piano tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. I'd be there. <laughs> Let's say that you wanted to learn to paint and Rembrandt were still alive. And he said, tomorrow come into my studio and I'll teach you everything I know. I'd be there. <laughs> Some of you ladies Suppose you wanted to cook and Julia Childs were still alive. And she said, meet me in the kitchen tomorrow night. And I'll teach you how to cook dinner. Well, he'd be right there. Best cook there was. Suppose you wanted to sing and Whitney Houston were still alive. And she said, tomorrow, can, j j just come over to my house and I'll teach you everything I know about singing. Suppose some of you guys wanted to learn to play golf. And tonight when you got home, you got a call from Jack Nicholas. Meet me at the golf course tomorrow morning. I'd be there. Suppose you wanted to play basketball and Michael Jordan sent you a text. <laughs> Meet me in the gym tomorrow morning. I'd be there. Suppose you wanted to lead worship or play guitar. 
And Chris Tomlin said, come to my house, I'd be glad to teach you. But who wants to teach you is not some finite human being. Who wants to teach you is Jesus, the one who knows everything. He wants to teach you how to pray. He wants to teach you how to minister for him. He wants to teach you how to love. He wants to teach you about spiritual gifts. He wants to tutor you, men, how to be a good husband. He wants to tutor you, wives, how to be a good wife. He wants to teach you, parents, how to be good parents. He wants to teach you how to be a blessing on your job and in your family. There's so many things Jesus wants to teach you. And he is the best teacher there is. And the reason why, he's such a wonderful teacher is because he's meek and lowly in heart. <laughs> the word that's translated meek here is an interesting word. There really is no English word to translate it. Our modern translations say gentle. That's a pretty good translation, but... The basic sense of the word is power under control. This particular word was used in the ancient times of medicine. If you give a, a person too much medicine, they're going to overdose. But if you give them medicine in just the right amount, it will heal them. It was used of the wind. Hurricane force wind can be very destructive. But if you take some wind and put it in a, uh, the sail of a ship, it becomes very useful because you have all that power under control. It was used of a horse in ancient times who was wild, but that horse broken and bridled it could become very useful. It was power under control. Whenever I think of this word, I have an illustration that comes to mind. It'll be stuck in your mind now too. It's Chuck Norris holding a butterfly. I mean, Chuck Norris, watch, 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 watch. <laughs> he's holding a butterfly, gentle. And the one, listen, who's omnipotent and all-powerful and spoke the universe into existence, he's so gentle. And he's lowly in heart. In other words, he doesn't make you come up to him. He comes down to you, to right where you are. And he's coming to you tonight. He wants to teach you, oh, what an invitation to be taught by Jesus. Mm -hmm. Like Matthew 12 and verse 20, it says of Jesus, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. A bruised reed, it's about ready to snap. He's not going to break it. He's going to be gentle with it. A wick that's just embers there. He's not going to snuff it out. He's going to bring, bring the fire back to life. I like Psalm 103 and verse 14. God knows our frame and he remembers we are dust. What a wonderful teacher Jesus is, and he wants to teach you, what do you want to learn from Jesus? You can just ask him, Lord, how do I do this? Could you please teach me? I would pray. I would pray when Jesus says, come to me, yoke with me, and learn from me. Our response would be like that of Samuel in 1 Samuel 3 and verse 10, when he said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I pray our response would be that of David in Psalm 25 and verse 4, when he said, show me your ways. Lord, teach me your paths. There is so much Jesus wants to teach you and one of the biggest lessons he's teaching you right now. He's teaching you to slow down, to stop hurrying, and to wait for him. This is a powerful lesson that was learned by a teenage boy in Japan in a way he never, ever forgot. 
It's told in the classic story by Chuck Swindoll called the tale of the tardy ox cart. He actually got the story from syndicated columnist Bill Rose. The story is in 1945, there was a farmer in Japan. He was trying to teach his son the importance of waiting on God's timing. And one day his son learned that lesson in a way he never, ever forgot. You see, several times a year, the farmer and his son would load their ox cart with vegetables. They would go to the nearest big city to sell their produce. Well, one morning, bright and early, they hitched up their ox to the cart, loaded the produce, and headed off on their long journey. The hurried son figured if they walked faster and faster and kept going all night, they could be there first to sell their produce at the highest price. So he kept prodding the ox with a stick and urging the beast to go faster and faster. His father said, take it easy, son. All in God's time. All in God's time. But father, he said, if we get in the market ahead of others, we'll get a better price. The father just said, all in God's time. All in God's time. Then as they journeyed on, the son grew more irritated when his father stopped by the roadside to find a comfortable spot to, to rest for a few hours. Just before sunrise, the son awoke his father. They headed down the road. About a mile down the road, they saw a farmer in the ditch. A total stranger, the father said, let's stop and help him. No, said the son, we got to get there. We don't have time for this. But the father said, all in God's time, all in God's time. And he got down to help the needy farmer. It was almost eight o'clock in the morning by the time they got back on the road. Suddenly, there was a great flash of lightning that split a clear sky. And it was followed by what sounded like thunder then beyond them, the hills and the sky grew dark. Looks like big rain in the city, said the old man. But the hurried son just grumbled all the more. If we'd have hurried like I would have wanted to, we would have been there by now and sold all of our produce. All in God's time, said the father. All in God's time. It was late afternoon of August 6, 1945, when they finally reached the top of the hill that overlooked the city. And when they saw the city, they stopped and stared down at it for a long, long time, neither of them saying a word. They just sat there as they looked down at what was Hiroshima, Japan, after the first atomic bomb had been dropped on that city. And if they'd had hurried, they would have been destroyed, along with so many other people that lost their lives that day. As they turned to go, the father looked at his son and said once again, all in God's time, all in God's time. The songwriter said, in his time, in his time. He makes all things beautiful in his time. Listen, Lord, please show me every day as you're teaching me your way that you'll do just what you say in your time. Dear ones, as I was praying about what to share with you tonight, I felt so strongly the Lord directing us to this passage because I believe there are so many of us who need that rest for our souls. And how do you find that rest? Oh, you come to Jesus, you yoke with Jesus, you walk with him, and then you learn from Jesus. I finish tonight with a prayer. It's a prayer I've read so many times. It's a prayer I seem to be praying more and more these days. A prayer written by Oren Crane called, Slow Me Down, Lord. He writes, Slow me down, Lord. Ease the pounding of my heart and quiet the trouble of my mind. 
Slow me down, Lord, and steady my hurried pace with the vision of the eternal reaches of time. In the confusion and flurry of the day, give me the calmness of the everlasting hills. Slow me down, Lord, and help me to send my roots deep into the soil of your word and your presence, that I might grow stronger and taller in thee. O oh Lord, remind me throughout the day that the race is not always to the swift, and that there is more to life than increasing its speed. Let me look up at the towering oak tree and know that it grew great and strong because it grew slowly and well. Slow me down, Lord, and help me to see that what it is I need most is to come to, to yoke with, and to learn from Thee. Father, we thank you so much for the words of our Savior that we have studied tonight. Lord, I feel in my heart I've needed them so much. I feel in my heart we've needed them so much. Lord, I pray for all these precious people here at Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. I, I've grown to love them so much. Lord, we live in such a crazy, busy, hurried, frantic world, and it's affecting all of us. We thank you, Lord, that we can just come into this place tonight and not be in a hurry. So just come here and, and rest. And Lord, I pray you would do in this moment what I can't do, what nobody else but you can do, and that is to give that rest, that renewing, that refreshing, that restoring in the souls of your people. Lord, I pray even now as we just spend a moment or two worshiping you. Lord, we pray that that renewing work would happen. It would be a miracle just inside of us, Lord. Everything that we need, we would catch our spiritual breath. <laughs> Lord, that as we wait upon you, that you would renew our strength. You would restore our soul. So bless us as we worship. We'll thank you for it. Let's stand together, can we? And let's just spend a few moments worshiping as we finish tonight. And let, let the Lord do that work in each of our hearts. Let's worship.